So I wanted to go over some stuff to begin with, so a little bit background on climate change, and then we'll move into sort of the meat, which is what you're really interested in, which is you know, what it what means in terms of public health. When I first started writing this book, and then I started writing this in about 2009, one of the books that I read uh, was by Thomas Friedman, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And you know, he was talking about the fact that there's this huge gap between what the scientists know about climate change and what people know about climate change. And um, I found that too. You know, I'd go interview the scientists and their hair's on fire, and then you sort of come up for air, and you know, no one's paying any attention. But he said that at a certain point, it will become blindingly obvious. So I, I think we're blindingly obvious now. Um, we can see this is from 2012. We're still waiting for all the data to come in from 2013. But just uh, some sobering statistics. If I could read these, I don't have them memorized. Um, the last two decades of the 20th century were the hottest in 400 years, perhaps the warmest in several millennia. In 2012, uh, the artist ice shrank to its smallest uh, summer millennium uh, 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 since record keeping began. Uh, the United States and Argentina experienced their hottest years ever. And because of the uh, lag in the climate system and the time it takes to adjust to all the carbon that we're already dumping in the atmosphere, we're on track for at least two to possibly even 11 degrees of warming by the end of the century. And I have to say, if we warm by 11 degrees, game over. I mean, it truly is the end of civilization as we know it. And we're going to be looking at die-offs in the billions. And I don't want to scare people, but it is conceivable that that might happen. I think two degrees we can handle, but we are going to be looking at very dramatic changes in ecosystems and in the way that we live. And just to kind of step back a little bit, when I first started researching this book, you know, I was trying to figure out, is there really actually a book here? And I stumbled across a study uh, that was done by some NASA scientists in Maryland, uh, the Siegfried Schubert. And he owes me some money because I've been giving him so much free publicity. But what he found is that the surface temperatures of the ocean had only heated up by one degree, just one degree, and that is what caused the drought that caused the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. So we can see that a one degree change in uh, you know, the ecosystems really have very far reaching consequences. Okay, you know, when we think of climate change, we think of these poor starving polar bears. But you know, this is what climate change really looks like. And the thing that climate scientists tell you, and this is true, we can't pin any one specific event on climate change. Is the polar vortex caused by climate change? Was Hurricane Katrina caused by climate change? We don't really know that. But what we do know is that climate change creates weather on steroids, so that um, hot places become hotter, drier places become drier. And you know, clearly we're seeing this here in you know, California and in the Southwest. So these are the Colorado floods. Uh, the Yosemite fires, you know, as we all know, the fires are really getting uh, worse. They're getting more intense. They're covering more areas because you're getting this drying out of vegetation because of drought. All right, Hurricane Sandy again. We don't really know if Hurricane Sandy was caused by climate change, although some of this stuff I think is common sense. NASA has created a threshold of 82 degrees, has, creates enough energy in the oceans to cause hurricanes. So you had heats of 80, 82 degrees in the water temperature um, at the end of October in New York. That sounds like climate change to me, although we can't really prove it. But what we can prove is that the storm surges that really devastated the, uh, the uh, New Jersey Shore and New York City were caused by climate change and were caused by rising temperatures. So we can see all this. I, I, I don't know if any of you have been to New York. These are incredible pictures. I mean, half of Manhattan was uh, debilitated. They didn't have heat. Uh, you had people in the south end of the island having to either move somewhere else or be really stranded. A friend of mine lives in this complex. Um, they were stranded. Again, here's Hurricane Katrina. 
Again, we can't say that uh, Hurricane Katrina was caused by climate change, but what we can say is that we're going to be seeing more extreme weather events with climate change. Um, these pictures were taken by Billy Shanks. He's on the right. And uh, the woman uh, next to him, she's carrying a six-day-old baby. And the reason that I bring this out is that Billy asked her, he said, why didn't you evacuate? And she said, I didn't think it was going to be that bad. And I think that this is where we are with climate change. We just don't think it's going to be that bad, which is why we're not sort of galvanized into urgent action. And the other thing, sort of parenthetically on all this, is that you know when I, when I talk to Billy, Billy's a very conservative guy. I always say his politics are to the right of Attila the Hun. And you know, I said to Billy, and he's a fire department captain in New Orleans. I said to him, Billy, look, I, you know, I'm not a lazy journalist. I don't like to exploit people. Um, this book is about climate change. If you don't believe in climate change, and I understand, I'm not going to try and convince you. I don't want you to feel exploited or taken advantage of when the book comes back out. And he said, I'm a firefighter. You don't have to tell me about climate change. So this is what we're looking at. And we're starting to experience this here in, this, uh, in the Southwest. This is uh, uh, the sustainability index by 2050 if we do nothing about carbon emissions. And so far, we're really not doing that. Uh, one little statistic I'd like to throw out at you that really always boggles my mind is that we are dumping 31.6 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every single year. And it's really hard to sort of wrap your hat, arms around what that means. But one gigaton is one billion tons. So um, one billion tons is about twice the mass of every single person on Earth. So 31.6 gigatons is approximately 60 times the mass of every single person on Earth. And this is what we're dumping every single year. And as I always say to my husband, what could go wrong? So this is what could go wrong. We're starting to see this. The Colorado River is drying up. Again, uh, sea level rise. We're predicting uh, uh, at least a three-foot sea level rise uh, by the end of uh, the, the century. So what does that mean? That means uh, goodbye, Florida. I, you know, I watch these uh, uh, house things where you know people are buying houses in the Florida Keys, and I'm going, I'm yelling at the TV set. I said, "You're nuts." It's not going to be there in 10 years. You know, you're taking your money and throwing it away. But what does this mean? This means coastal cities, you know, especially on the Atlantic coast, are very vulnerable. We're vulnerable here, too, to some extent. Uh, San Diego, Los Angeles is vulnerable. San Francisco, especially Seattle, especially Vancouver. You know, so we're really vulnerable to the kind of storm surges that we saw in New York. All right, so what does this mean in terms of health? You know, this is kind of background, so now we sort of drill down to the health. And my book really focused on the United States because I really wanted people to understand that climate change is already happening here, and we're already experiencing the effects of it. And one of my chapters, I, went, I spent a month down in Australia because for a lot of reasons, they're on the front lines of climate change. Just quickly, they're a big flat desert island. So they uh, really don't have a lot of water. And they're surrounded by three different oceans, the southern, uh, the Indian, and the Pacific Ocean. So they're sort of uh, uh, vulnerable to all the different ocean currents there. And I wanted to look at what climate change looks like in a first world country, because you know, it's very easy for the general public to sort of dismiss climate change. You, know, you look at what happened in the Philippines. And again, you know, that typhoon that hit, we can't say that that was climate change. But what we can say is that weather, extreme weather events like that typhoon will be happening with increasing frequency. But you know, you can sort of dismiss that in your mind. Well, they don't have the infrastructure and this and that and the other thing. And we're going to be able to withstand it better here. But I don't think so. So uh, my assistant thinks I'm really boring. So <laughs> anyway, so. These are the general things that we're going to see here is more natural disasters will strain the healthcare system beyond its limits. We saw that with Hurricane Katrina, and we also saw that with Hurricane Sandy. And I was really very dismayed when I saw what happened with Hurricane Sandy, because Hurricane Sandy happened seven years after Hurricane Katrina. 
And one of the very basic lessons of Hurricane Katrina we didn't seem to learn, which is if you're in a floodplain, don't put your backup generators in the basement. Duh. I mean, and you know, we saw this spectacle uh, at NYU Medical Center and also at Bellevue, but especially NYU, where you had, you know, all these uh, ambulances lined up outside of NYU where they had to be evacuated in the middle of the storm because the backup generators failed. But to talk a little bit about Hurricane Katrina, um, some of the stats on Hurricane Katrina are really just sort of mind-boggling. And you know, you always think, well, we know better, it's not going to happen here. But we saw a replay of a lot of this in New York, which you would think would be really a lot more on top of this. Uh, in Hurricane Katrina, only three of 16 area hospitals were able to reopen after the storm. So you know what that means. I mean, people just couldn't really get medical care. Um, they didn't have any medical records, so people had no idea what kind of drugs people were taking. People were interrupted in the middle of chemotherapy, so you didn't know what kind of chemotherapies they were supposed to have. Um, I talked to public health doctors. They said for years, literally probably two years after Hurricane Katrina, health care was unacceptably primitive. Uh, one doctor told me that, you know, she's a public health doctor. She had a patient, and I just use these little examples to illuminate what was going on. She had a patient that was uh, coughing in her waiting room. And there was not a laboratory to test the man's sputum in New Orleans. To test the man's sputum, she had to send his sputum away 500 miles to a place in Texas or put him on a bus to Baton Rouge, 80 miles, so he could cough all over everybody on the bus. So these are just you know, little basic you know, examples of the kinds of things that happened in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. After Hurricane Katrina, only one level one trauma center was open until uh, 2008. So I think that was three years where they had only one level one trauma center, which meant that half, at least half, maybe even 60% of all level one trauma patients had to be airlifted to Shreveport, which was 350 miles away. Now you folks are public health people, you do the math. We all know when you have a gunshot wound, when you have a stroke, when you have a heart attack, you know, time is brain, time is heart. Time is the difference between living and dying or actually making a full recovery or a lifetime of disability. So there was a lot of excess disability, excess death that happened because they just didn't have the apparatus. And the other piece of this is that this was an equal opportunity destroyer. It didn't matter if you had health insurance, if the health system wasn't there and up to snuff, it wasn't going to happen. So these are the kinds of things that happened. And then within a year after Katrina, uh, mortality rates went up by 25%. You had um, much higher incidences of alcoholism, drug addiction, domestic abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the kind of you know, cascade effects that happen from the collapse of the public health system. And the public health system hasn't completely recovered since then. We saw the same thing, not as bad with Hurricane Sandy, but we did see you know, what I call a spectacle, because they should have learned from this. Uh, NYU and Bellevue had to shut down and uh, had to evacuate patients. And as public health people, you know what that means. You know, this is a cascade effect. It puts extra um, pressures on the hospitals that surrounded in surrounding areas. Uh, people with chronic diseases weren't getting their medications. Uh, weeks after uh, Superstorm Sandy hit, you had public health nurses that were going out trying to find chronically ill patients who were stranded on the 12th floor of apartment buildings in diabetic comas because they couldn't get their medication. Just to give you an idea of how bad things were during Hurricane Sandy, the uh, Doctors Without Borders, for the very, very first time in its history, set up a clinic on American soil in the far Rockaways in Brooklyn, which was very hard hit by Hurricane Sandy. So this is the kind of things that we're looking for. And, you know, as these types of extreme weather events become more frequent, and it's not just hurricanes, it's going to be floods and storm surges. And, you know, the coast of, uh, you know, of the Atlantic Ocean is, is very threatened. But we also, in the midsection of the country, is very flood prone. And we have, you know, I don't want to get into these kind of details, but we have a very poor levee system. 
And there's something like 100 million people that are threatened by floods. You know, we saw the floods that happened in, in Denver and in the Colorado area. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking for that destroys the public health system. It means that you can't get health care. You know, obviously the elderly, people with chronic illnesses are on the front lines, but any one of us can have a heart attack and the health, uh, public health system is not gonna be there. Okay, the other thing is uh, increasingly bad air. Some of you I know have done research on this will trigger rising rates of allergies, asthma, heart and lung diseases, and even dementia. There's a growing body of evidence now that inhaling those ultrafine particulates can cause dementia and uh, cognitive decline. Um, there's a couple studies. When I did the book, there was only one study, so I didn't really talk about it that much. But since the book has come out, you know, we've seen more and more of this. If I can just look at my notes for a, a, a second. You know, there was a, a health study that was done at USC. Some of you may be familiar with it. But they found that the uh, lung development of children, you know, who live near uh, areas of high pollution was about 20% smaller than average. And the thing that's really scary about this, and some of you may know all this already, is that, you know, you can't catch up. You know, there's a certain developmental window with lung development. And if you don't have that, miss, if you miss that developmental window, it shuts down and you grow up and you're impaired. So that's one aspect of it. You know, that the heat trapping carbon dioxide, it also accumulates in these carbon domes over cities. And we see in these cities at high, higher rates, you can see this happening now in China and Beijing, have higher rates of asthma, uh, heart and lung diseases, allergies, respiratory infections, things like that. Um, something very interesting about allergies, and this really does have to do a lot with climate change. And one of the things I focused on in my book is a research by uh, uh, this plant biologist at the USDA, Louis Ziska. He's another person who owes me money. Anyway, um, he found, and I talked about it, what I call hoodlum weeds. Um, he found, you know, obviously CO2 is good for photosynthesis. So when you have these weeds that are on this diet, supercharged diet of turbocharged CO2, they grow to these huge levels. And he did this experiment, which has become sort of one of these classic experiments, where he planted weeds in downtown Baltimore, which really sort of mimicked, you know, the kind of uh, carbon dioxide that we're going to be having, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years. It had something like four or five, four to 500 carbon parts per million. And then he planted weeds in a suburban area, which more reflects, you know, the sort of uh, carbon parts per million that we have now. And then he uh, planted in an organic farm in a rural area. And what he found is that the uh, weeds that were planted in downtown, the hoodlum weeds as I call them, they grew to twice, twice the height of the weeds out in the organic farm. And in addition, the weeds were 100 times as noxious. So it's not your imagination. I, I've got, I have allergies now, and I never did before. So this is something that we're looking at, too. And the allergy seasons are longer. OK, insects migrating to newly worn habitats and uh, changing ecosystems will cause outbreaks of West Nile, dengue, hantavirus pulmonary system, valley fevers, and exotic diseases we've never seen before. Um, just to sort of step back, I don't know if any of you read the New York Times yesterday, but there was a, uh, an article on, please don't shoot me if I mispronounce this, chikungunya, okay, which is um, uh, a disease that's uh, endemic in Southeast Asia. And you know now we're seeing it in the eastern parts of the Caribbean. Um, so just to talk about this a little bit, What's happening is that mosquitoes are migrating to these newly warm habitats. And I think that uh, the uh, uh, Aedes aegypti, which is the Asian tiger mosquito, is a really good example of this. The Asian tiger mosquito arrived in the United States in 1985 and um, in a, some, I guess, some used tires or something into Houston. And they did a recent study, and it has now migrated northward to Connecticut, and they fully expect it to be in Maine by the end of the century. And the problem with the Aedes aegypti is that uh, the Aedes aegypti can transmit 
chikungunya. Am I pronouncing it correctly? I hope so. Chikungunya, dengue, uh, three different types of encephalitis, yellow fever. You get the picture. Uh, I think that how West Nile arrived in the United States is really a good example. Uh, West Nile was first discovered, West Nile virus was first discovered in, I guess it was 1938 in the uh, West Nile district in Egypt, uh, in Uganda, excuse me. And it really, you know, you just had sort of local outbreaks in Israel and places like that. And then in 1999, we had an outbreak here in uh, New York, New York City. And what happened was we had the kind of weather patterns that you're going to be seeing more and more of with climate change. So this is what I'm talking about, how ecosystems really enhance the um, spread of infectious diseases. You had uh, torrential rains, and then you had hot, hot, hot days, which allowed the mosquito populations to explode. And what the public health officials, near as they could tell, uh, so there was an outbreak in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and somebody from, you know, some Israeli was visiting his relatives in Whitestone. I grew up in Whitestone, so this was sort of chilling to me when I was reading this. And he was just sitting out on the front porch, and some mosquito bit him, and there you go, and it got transmitted. Now, those of you who study this know that, you know, it's hard for a disease to really gain a foothold, and I'm sure that there were people here who were sick with West Nile who arrived before, but it was able to gain a foothold because there were so many mosquitoes that carried it, and they you know, transmitted it to the bird population, and so it gained the foothold, and then in 2002, when we had a similar weather pattern, you know, torrential rains with this, followed by these hot, hot weather, it exploded across the country. Uh, dengue fever which we eradicated here, uh, we had um, a lo what's called a local outbreak in, um, in Florida. So, and what we mean by local outbreaks is you're getting it here. It's not like somebody was sick in Venezuela and brought it in. So, you know, we're looking at dengue fever here, same in Texas, we had outbreaks there. Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, I mean, that's another one that, and this isn't necessarily imported, but this is something that, you know, these dormant illnesses will be enhanced by changes in weather patterns. Uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, we first saw that in 19, um, I believe it was 1992 in the Four Corners area, and it has a 30% uh, mortality rate, you know, it, it hits the lungs, people, people uh, essentially drown. And what happens with hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is that you have the very hot, hot weather, and then you have torrential rains after the hot weather. And the hot weather burns off all the surface vegetation, and then you have these intense torrential rains that suddenly allows an explosion in this, and it allows the carriers of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, the deer mice, their population explodes because suddenly there's food for them. And we saw this hantavirus pulmonary syndrome outbreak in 1992. Then you had a very similar weather pattern two summers ago in Yosemite, where we had a hantavirus pulmonary syndrome outbreak. Here again, two people died, and tens of thousands of people were exposed all over the world. So higher temperatures also mean uh, spikes in heat wave-related deaths. And I want to, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, the heat waves that we've had. We had uh, a terrible heat wave in Chicago in 1995. And um, just looking at my notes here, sorry. Uh, we had a, a heat wave in uh, 1995. And at that time, and this is really an excellent book, a uh, social autopsy of what happened in Chicago. Uh, public officials downplayed it. You know, they said, oh, there's nothing to worry about. And you know, the problem is, again, you, know, you have these developmental windows that we're talking about. You know, after a couple days when people have uh, heat stroke, you reach a point of no return where they can't be revived. You know, they had people in ambulances who were, they were giving them you know, intravenous feeding and water, and it was already too late. So by the time they figured out what was happening, they were looking at a really uh, a disaster. And you know, they had to buy. Um, you know, they had to get refrigerated trucks because the morgues got full. Ultimately, 773 people died, mostly elderly shut-ins 
and about 3,500 people were transported to area hospitals, and within a year, half of them died. And many of them were left with permanent disabilities because of you know, neurological problems. So I, again, I, I really wish people would talk to each other because this happened, you know, again, you know, between what happened with Hurricane Katrina and what happened with Hurricane Sandy. This was the European heat wave in 2003. Uh, again, uh, this was sort of a perfect storm. Uh, it happened in August uh, when everybody was on vacation, including public health officials. Uh, it happened in places like, you know, Germany, especially in France, where there was no air conditioning, and everybody had gone and parked their elderly relatives in these nursing homes that really did not have the facilities to deal with the heat. They didn't have showers. Uh, they didn't have air conditioning. So uh, I, I want to talk about this a little bit more. They didn't have showers. They didn't have air conditioning. And again, you know, the public health officials downplayed what was going on. And ultimately, a lot of heads rolled afterwards. You know, a lot of people were fired. And the doctors in the emergency rooms and the undertakers, undertakers, were the ones who, you know, set up the alarm signals that something's happening here. And, you know, here again, you know, they had to, you know, rent uh, refrigerated trucks, you know, to, you know, take care of all the bodies, which is really sort of devastating. And ultimately, um, anywhere between 35,000 and 70,000 people died in the heat wave in 2003 across Europe and, and 15,000 in France. Now, what's really so significant about this is that the 2003 heat wave, it was hotter in Europe. It was the hottest time in Europe since Henry VIII had been on the throne of England. That's how hot it was. But here's the kicker on that. If we continue to dump carbon in the atmosphere the way we are, and we show no signs of slowing down, by 2040, according to the Hadley Center, half of all European summers will be hotter. So that is really, really scary. And what climate modelers also found is that heat trapping carbon doubled the likelihood of the 2003 heat wave, which is the very, very first time that climate modelers have really been able to pin a weather event on you know, the excess carbon in the atmosphere. Again, you know, 2010, uh, we had this terrible heat wave in, in Russia. Probably the only good thing to come out of the heat wave in Russia is that the Russian leadership finally admitted that climate change was actually happening. Um, you know, you have this compounded by uh, the peat bog fires. Now, I don't know if you guys know anything about peat bog, but um, the fires, because of the heat, would uh, spontaneously ignite. And peat bog is sort of this underground mulch. And these fires continue burning. They're almost impossible to put out. And so um, uh, Moscow was just surrounded by this. So you had this, uh, this you know, uh, this confluence of the smog and then this incredible heat. And you know, I talked to people when it was happening. I did real-time interviews when it was going on. And you know, they were talking about, you know, there was only air conditioning in the hotels. You know, you go to the store, fights broke out to buy fans, and they were paying $200 for fans that normally cost about $20. Anyway, ultimately, you can't get you know, really good figures from you know, the Russian officials, but public health officials estimate that 52,000 people died in these heat waves. And as we see more and more of these kinds of heat waves, we're going to see higher and higher die-offs. You know, I was talking to uh, one of the experts uh, who I interviewed for the book, Stephen Sherwood, you know, and he's one of these guys that you know, just sort of drips brains and doesn't suffer fools gladly. And I said to him, well, why don't we just get air conditioning? I thought he was going to kill me. I really, I did. I thought he was just going to lean over the desk and you know, choke me to death. You, know, you could just hear every synapse in his brain crackling. And he said, do you think people in developing countries can afford air conditioning? Do you think in 20 years, when uh, energy costs are triple or quadruple what they are now, they're going to be able to afford air conditioning? So, I mean, we're looking at really high die-offs, and I don't even want to say. All right, now, valley fever. Uh, valley fever is endemic in the Central Valley of California. That's where it got its name. 
Uh, it's also endemic in Arizona. And again, you know, it's sort of the uh, kind of climate that we uh, gives rise to things like hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, where you have this hot, hot weather that burns off surface vegetation, and it allows the fungus that carries valley fever, which lives uh, several layers down in the earth, to sort of uh, multiply a lot, simply because the surface vegetation that kind of controls it is burned off. So what we're looking at now is a silent epidemic. They sicken as many as probably 150,000 people annually and claims at least 200 lives a year, which is more than West Nile, Lyme disease, or salmonella. So this is just another one of the diseases that we're seeing You know, in the uh, environmental belt that's hospitable to valley fever is extending. This is our friend, the Aedes aegypti, the Asian tiger mosquito. Again, as I mentioned, you know, it's migrating northward. Uh, bad air, harmful effects kill at least 24,000 Californians every year. Residents have a 25% higher risk of dying. And we're going to see more and more of this as the bad air spreads across the country. As I always say, you know, think Central Valley, think Salt Lake City, and think Beijing. This is bad air in the Central Valley. The other piece of this, and this I think is really important for public health people, is that climate change is also an environmental justice issue. And I don't think we can really forget this, because it's going to be uh, poor and disenfranchised communities that are hit hardest, not only you know, in developing countries, but here in the United States. Uh, Martha Coda is an environmental activist, and she, became, she was a social worker in her native Mexico. Uh, she became an environmental activist here when her son became very ill with asthma and then her other kids got respiratory infections. They were living near the port in Long Beach, and she became part of the Children's Health Study at USC, and she realized that it was the carbon in the atmosphere the excess carbon down at the port that was really causing this. This is her son, Jose Miguel Guerrero. And you can see he's not a very robust kid. He's really not, you know, and he had a, a you know, 20% reduction in his lung development. And he's been plagued by asthma and other respiratory diseases. There is some good news. <laughs> um, okay, that's me drinking sewage. Anyway, um, when I was doing the book, when I first started writing the book, I really kind of despaired, you know, because it seemed like no one was paying attention, especially in Washington. Thank God the president finally mentioned climate change in his State of the Union speech, you know, but that was just his past year, and it's way overdue, and, you know, it didn't seem like anything was going on. But what I found, and I was very heartened about this, is that a local level, you know, where the rubber meets the road, People take this all very, very seriously. And I found that climate change is not a red or a blue issue. It's a green issue. Uh, Orange County, you guys are here in Orange County. This is pretty, a pretty conservative county. But Orange County is really a world leader in water management. Uh, I, I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Toilet to Tap program. A lot of you are drinking that same water that I'm drinking, which is you know recycled. Uh, Toilet water, 20% uh, of the water in Orange County is recycled toilet water, and 40% will be within the next year they're expanding. This is one of the ways that we have to go, you know, to sort of step back. Uh, you know, with the drought in California, I'm probably one of the few people that isn't hysterical because I know that good minds are working on all of this and that there's a suite of strategies that we can employ that can really keep us hydrated you know, well into the next century. And that is what I really found very heartening. Uh, there was a water summit about a couple weeks ago at UCLA. You know, the Australians, for obvious reasons, are world leaders in water management because they have none. And they've had to manage the water. And the things that the Australians are doing are the things that we need to be doing. And we're starting to do. Uh, this is, uh, they're ex uh, extending the facilities. This is Pat Marroy. She just retired. She is a legend in water management circles, and she is the reason that Las Vegas still exists. Las Vegas is probably the driest city in the driest state in the United States. Um, sort of complicated, and I'm just going to run through this really quickly, but uh, the allocations from the Colorado River are divvied up according to the Colorado River Compact, which was uh, 
adjudicated, I guess, in 1922. And obviously, the world has changed a lot since 1922. And you know, the supplies were divvied up according to uh, agriculture. And so places like Nevada, where they didn't do very much farming, didn't get much at all. So she was faced with this mushrooming city that had essentially no water. And the kind of uh, programs that she instituted in Las Vegas, we have to be doing in other parts of the country. Uh, the first thing that she did was she went to all the big you know, resorts and she told them, you can have your water features, but all that water has to be gray water. It's got to be recycled. Not only did she get them to recycle it, she got them to pay for the recycling, which I thought was really tremendous. Uh, then the next thing that she did was a cash for grass program. We've got to do this here. You know, when I drive around, you know, LA County or Orange County, it's nuts to me. And I'm just as bad. We've got a green lawn too. We need to rip it all out. I have a friend of mine who, you know, talking about Paul Mul Pat Mulroy, she said it was up to her. Pat Mulroy would rip out every blade of grass in <laughs> Las Vegas. And she's right, you know, and they've been, you know, paying people money to uh, plant drought resistant gardens and things like that. That was the second thing. The third thing that she did was very stringent water conservation measures. It's another thing that we have to do. The upshot is that um, the average water use per person is about 135 gallons a day. She got it down in Las Vegas to 75, and they're shooting for 50. And this is what we have to do, you know, these kinds of things. All right, Los Angeles, we're trying to move beyond coal. Uh, the other thing I found is that across the country, people are trying to create more sustainable cities. Uh, Vancouver is a much more sustainable city. And now, I always say Vancouver is like, you know, that kid in high school who used to kill the curve in every subject and make the rest of us look bad. You know, Vancouver has the lowest rate of teenage pregnancy, uh, highest, uh, best health, highest longevity per capita, you know, on and on and on and on. They're first, you know, boring, boring, boring. But the reason why is because Vancouver is a very livable city. They never built a freeway system within the city limits. So that you have, and that's a whole long story, and I won't get into it here, why that happened. And it wasn't because the city fathers had this great foresight. It was because the people in Vancouver would, didn't allow it to happen. They, had, they got smart, and they said, we don't want to do this. But the upshot is that you had, and I was just in Vancouver. It was one of the places I went that I was you know, giving uh, talks about the book is that it's this incredibly vibrant, livable city with all these different neighborhoods and communities. People walk. You know, the same thing with New York City. I never thought this, but you know, when I was doing my research, I found that New York City was one of the greener cities. You know, you look at Manhattan Island, it's because they have, you know, such a wonderful transit system. You know, people get exercise. They exercise an average of 19 minutes a day, which, as you know, is two-thirds of our minimum daily requirement. This is uh, my friend Margie Goldsmith, the great travel journalist. And I, she had this on her website and said, Margie, I've got to use this in my slideshow. Uh, this is the uh, bike sharing program that they have now in New York. And you know, you can just pick up a bike, ride it someplace, and leave it somewhere else. And I want to tell you, you know, they have bike lanes in New York. And you haven't lived until you dodged a New Yorker when you're trying to you know, cross the bike lanes. So there's a lot of positive things going on around the country. Um, the other piece of this that I think would be of interest for public health people is that the CDC is all over this, bless their hearts. They are really beefing up the surveillance networks. Um, you know, obviously, because uh, these bugs are migrating northward, a lot of the bugs are coming in through Mexico. So they've beefed up, uh, beefed up the Border Patrol. They've uh, created alliances with the Mexican Secretary of Health, Secretary of Health, to really sort of have surveillance and monitor what's happening. So I think this is all really good. I noticed uh, that you were talking about emerging diseases and uh, people looking. And a lot of the emerging diseases are coming out of Asia for a variety of reasons, some of them climate driven. You know, if I could step back just a little bit, the um, Drought-driven collapse of agriculture in Asia is sending people to the cities, and you know they end up living in kind of these urban shanty towns, which are sort of breeding grounds, you know, for infectious diseases, and they're bringing with them, you know, SARS and things like that, you know, that are jumping 
you know, from animals to humans. So, but there are a lot of positive things that are happening. So what we must do as human beings, you know, we have to move to renewable energy. We all have to reduce our carbon footprint. And we have to get involved and get active. And I think that we can fix this. You know, if we play our cards right, the adaptation strategy we need to adopt can create a better, healthier, happier world. I mean, we've created these cities where you have to get in a car to, you know, get milk. And this isn't good. Um, New Yorkers, Manhattanites, are 12% thinner than the rest of the population. You don't see really fat people in New York. A little chunky sometimes, but not really fat people, because they walk. Uh, you know, this is my, I have to say, this is my assistant. You know, she's getting really jazzy with this. I leave you with this, and as public health people, you're really on the front lines of this, and, and you're young, you are going to see this in your careers. Within the next 20 years, we're going to see a lot of really transformative changes. Anything else you're interested in is not going to happen if you can't breathe the air and drink the water. Don't sit this one out. Do something. By an accident of fate, we're alive in an absolutely critical moment in the history of our planet. And this is from the late, great Carl Sagan. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Do, you have... Do we have time for questions? We have time for some questions. Okay. No questions? Well, I have one. Oh, okay. So, uh, last week, the United Nations appointed the Ecuador as the climate and cities envoy. I find it very important to meet the United Nations presented in the preparation of the New York City for Hurricane Sandy. We learned something in the period of probably. Uh, do you have a sense of what these strategies mean? How we might convince other big cities that they will invest money in this? Well, I, I, I disagree with you. Okay. I, I, think, I think that um, the failure of NYU was the failure of NYU. I don't think it was Bloomberg. Bloomberg has been a real leader in trying to uh, get a, I, should I, can people hear me? OK. Bloomberg has been a real leader. And you know, I talked about it a lot in the book. And you know, I don't want to bore everybody. But you know, they had a plan, uh, New York City 2007. And he has really, uh, they put in the bike lanes. That was the first thing. Um, and the bike sharing programs, they've really been sort of beefing up the, uh, to prevent the storm surges. Obviously not enough. But you know, they're sort of moving in the, wrong dire in the right direction, you know, pushing. It takes time. You know, it's a big city. You know, you can't, you know, turn around, as I always say, you can't around the, turn around the Queen Mary on a dime. Um, you know, on and on and on. Um, uh, they planted trees. They had a million trees program. And they planted half of them, you know, to reduce the urban heat island effect. They've been painting roofs. I think that, I actually disagree, because I think that he's really been a world leader in this kind of thing. The other thing is there's a, a Climate 40, and he's been, you know, head of Climate 40 as well. And that is a, um, a consortium of 120 of the largest metropolises around the world. And, they, and, they, and as I said, I felt that, you know, I was really sort of heartened, you know, seeing all this thing going on. Because places all over the world are really trying to reduce their carbon footprint, make their cities more livable, and reduce the carbon footprint of everybody who lives there by introducing mass transit, you know, uh, introducing, you know, better uh, heat wave warning systems so that they have cooling centers when you have a heat wave where people can go and cool off. So I, I actually disagree with that. Well, I was just thinking about his preparation for the hurricane. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. But he has been doing a lot, and he has been a world leader in that. Anyway, go ahead. Wouldn't you say that Bloomberg sort of, I mean, I understand that he's been doing a lot, but as someone who lived in New York for a long time, he does a lot at, like, how do you, could you speak to, like, sort of disparities as far as income go? Like, a million trees, city bikes, all those things are sort of, like, in downtown areas. Well, and those are the areas that were affected by Sandy. However, it's not really in places like Lower East Side or in, in parts of Brooklyn. I mean, those are important things to sort of address, too, how you sort of address that type of thing when everybody should be
No, I agree with you. I, the po point that she's making, and this is a criticism of Bloomberg, and I don't want to sort of get off on this because I'm not an apologist for Bloomberg because I think he's set a good example, but obviously he's not perfect. And uh, to sort of distill the criticism that you're making, forgive me, was a criticism of Bloomberg is that, you know, the things that he did do really helped uh, upper and middle class people, and he really didn't really deal with the people who are really most exposed to this. And that I do agree with. And I think that we have to have more of that dialogue, because those are the people who are really on the front line. So I do agree with you. But I don't want to get, I don't want to get off on the, you know, because I, I think that, you know, for a lot of reasons he was appointed. You know, he has a visible presence. He has uh, earned, you know, some accolades as a steward of the earth. But yeah, we can, we can criticize everybody. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, thank I you so. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I, I think we need to bring it back to California. So, uh, you talked about the the draft. Yeah. Uh, in the last week too, uh, I know the chancellors of the University of California campuses, you know, tried to do something about the current uh, emergency states that the government declared based on water. Uh, and I, I think we are used to reacting to crisis, and uh, at the smaller scale, that's what this water crisis is. If you think it through, I think it's more likely that people will respond to crisis than do this proactive climate change uh, thing. What, what is going on in the... Did you talk to some social scientists about how to get people motivated to kind of see the investment in the future as opposed to let's deal with something that already not always well, it's hard. I, I, and I did talk to social scientists. The question he's asking is the question that really stymies everybody, I, you know, because I talk to a lot of activist groups. And they're very frustrated because you go out, we'll leave this, we'll leave this auditorium and everybody will be going out living their lives not aware of any of these things and not making any of the kind of changes that they need to make. How do you motivate people? They don't really know. It's only when people, I, I think when it directly affects them. I mean, I, we're only at a stage where people finally acknowledge on a widespread basis that climate change is happening and that it is an actual threat. So what the next step is, what do you do? You know, how do you do that? And that's why I try and talk about it. all of us need to reduce our carbon footprint. That's where it starts with us. And then the other piece is getting active. But how do you motivate people? How do you galvanize them? And I think it's only when they, it becomes a direct threat to them that people become, because people are busy with their lives. It's not, you know, a, a, a criticism. It's just a sort of a, you know, reality. But I, I agree. And, and we don't know yet. Anyway, go ahead. Um, as I surf the web and read about climate change and what have you, um, and reducing the carbon footprint, I also am starting to see uh, scientists talking about plants that um, possibly include stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. Okay, I have my own feelings about that, and I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist, you know, I just report on this, but, um, you know, I work for Discover, and my old boss at Discover, who's since left Discover, Corey Powell, um, is a very smart guy, and he said, so we're going to shoot all this sulfur up in the atmosphere, what could go wrong? You know, I mean, this is a grand experiment. What happens if there are unintended consequences? So that's what I sort of feel about that. You know, the, the idea of, you know, spewing all this sulfur in the atmosphere. I'm hearing more and more about it. And so I'm wondering, is there any research being done about the health impact of deploying well, I, I would be more concerned about just the basic impacts. I think that, you know, I mean, we can't do these grand experiments on a global level without really knowing what their long-term consequences are. So I, you know, and I don't know if I'm answering your question. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Excuse me, I want to answer to you. I want the effect of climate change in long term. And as I know, um, this effect is kind of uh, because I'm a science, scientist and I say everything with the uh, significant, statistical significance we can really love. As I know, 
um, this kind of effect of climate change is kind of exaggeration. Because right now I'm working on the effect of climate change on type of climate change, on soil, uh, carbon and nitrogen cycle, and uh, soil can mitigate this effect in long term. Mitigate what effects are you talking uh, about? For example, yeah. For example, um, soil can uh, sequester a huge amount of carbon. Do you know the meaning of sequestration? Carbon no, sequestration. Uh, can, soil can keep huge amount of carbon in the soil. But you know, so if, if you have aerosol spraying, there's other elements of understanding. Right. And I, I see I have a lot of reluctance about that. That scares me. But the point she's bringing out, my firm, a very good friend of mine, has a book coming out in about three weeks called The Soil Will Save Us, you know, which talks to this issue. And she's a wonderful journalist, too. So maybe you might want to check that out, because I, I think that this is something that, because the, the, the dialogue is now opening up with some kind of sensible solutions. I'm not sure the spraying up in the air is one of the sensible. That scares me, to be perfectly honest. Me too, and that's why I was wondering what you knew about it. Yeah, well, I, what I know about it scares me. Yeah. Good. yeah. We don't have a control on yeah. that <laughs> Right. But this soil thing is a very different thing with the carbon sequestration. You know, and there's been a lot of really good evidence on that. And you should buy my friend's book, too, which is coming mm -hmm. out. Anyway. Well, on that note, thank okay. you so much. Okay, anyway, thank you for coming. Okay, anyway.